morning, everyone. What a beautiful morning in the house of the Lord. Well, it's good to see such a group gathered. Before we uh, turn our attention to the Word, just a couple of things. Uh, a very special uh, pastor in our history, I guess in my history in particular, this was the, the Paddocks. Uh, Robert and Geraldine were influential. As a matter of fact, some of you have heard me tell the story that it was actually the prompting of the Spirit on their, his ministry that led me into ministry. And uh, they're, they are now well into their senior years. Just a couple of years ago, Geraldine was diagnosed with cancer and given very little hope that she would live. Since that time, God has miraculously touched her. And she recently released a CD. It's called My Tribute. And uh, I know CDs are kind of a passe thing now, but uh, of course, I believe it's plans is to, to make this available on Spotify. But uh, we did bring in a few uh, because we know that there's some of you here with the Newfoundland constituency in particular that would know her. So if you want to, you can see Natasha and she'll get you a copy of that for $20. But I thought this one, I don't do this very often. As a matter of fact, we don't even bring in CDs and sell them. And uh, you're probably aware of people who've asked and we said no. I have to say that's purely selfish, but these people mean so much to me that uh, I decided to do that. The reason we don't generally do it is because we end up with a lot of products sitting around. And uh, because that day is, CD day is kind of gone, is that certainly? But who's the CD era here? Most of us don't have vehicles now have these things. I got it, I'm trying to figure out how do I get it on things, right? So it's the day we live in. Uh, if you're visiting Family Christian Center this morning here physically, uh, if you're visiting us virtually or you know, through H. Uh, SBN and some other means this morning, we are so thankful that you've joined us and uh, we're excited to have you. Uh, we want to give you an opportunity to connect with us in a deeper way. So if you're here in the building, there's a little card in the seat pocket in front of you. Please fill that out. If you don't complete it all, uh, at least get your name written in an eligible way and uh, so that we can kind of pick up on it and make sure your phone number is there. Uh, an email, something that allows us to connect with you. Drop it off at the cafe and uh, they will give you your freebie of your choice. If you're uh, uh, joining us outside of here through other means, we can't offer you a coffee right now, but uh, plan to visit, and we sure love to do that. But you can visit us through the link that's on the screen. Riley, would you do me a favor and get that little clicker for me somewhere so we can begin to move forward? I have a little memory lapse coming in this morning and didn't pick that device up. Uh, but. Uh, we're going to turn our attention again this morning to a subject that we've been in for a couple of weeks now, uh, the Holy Spirit. And uh, it's interesting because, you know, God's really been doing thank you. It's hard to get good help today, but I have some good help around here, I can assure you. <laughs> and uh, God's been doing some great things among us a few Sundays back. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it was, I think, the very first Sunday in, in the new year, right? You or the second Sunday or something, Riley had uh, shared the word that morning in the after service as people were gathered around the altar. Uh, Sherry, I'm not sure if you're here this morning, but you wave at me somewhere where you are, but Sherry shared with us how, uh, how she began to experience uh, just the sensation to, to speak out, and she began to speak, and she, she didn't fully understand it, came forward afterwards, get some explanation, and, uh, and realized that the Holy Spirit had just come upon her, and she began to speak in tongues. And, uh, yeah, the mirror, mirror, so give God glory for, for that. And, uh, just uh, last Sunday, I understand, she had a similar experience, kind of affirmed that, what God's doing in her life. We have, so, you know, it doesn't have to be, sometimes we talk about this infilling of the Holy Spirit, and we're going to talk about different aspects of it again this morning. Uh, but for Pentecostals and Charismatics, uh, many of them, and others, the, the issue of the, the glossy or the tongues is very much a part of it. Some people don't understand that. My goal through this series, and I, I do one of these series about every two years, have on this theme, and uh, 
is to take the mystery away and all the scariness that people seem to have associated with this. And, uh, and so, you know, it's beautiful when, when God just does it in that kind of a way, you know, it just, just happens naturally. And that's what should, it should be uh, in, the, in the life of the church. The gifts of the Spirit should just be flowing into our lives in a natural way. We're going to discover that this morning. Today we're going to talk about the purpose and the benefits of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Now, we will not exhaust that topic. It's not possible to do it on a Sunday morning, uh, but uh, we will dive somewhat into it. So let's go. In his book, uh, Caleb uh, Empowered Understanding the Spirit in This Generation, uh, Caleb Weary uh, identifies, well, it's been identified before him, but he, he points it out again, these seven spheres of influence uh, are in our world, these, these seven spheres where uh, uh, there's these spheres each have their own dynamic. And he talks about how the power of the Spirit upon this generation is crafted in such a way that it is able to impact and infiltrate and transform every one of these spheres. Now, we look at these spheres, they're called the mountains, you know, in these terms, these seven mountains of authority or influence in our world, education, church, family, media, government, arts and entertainment, science and technology. And, you know, some of us think, okay, I'm comfortable in the church environment, but how do I actually take the gospel into science and technology. And we, we've had this sense over the years, you know, science and technology are, uh, you know, antichrists and, and there's a pushback and, and the two shall never meet. That's not true. In actuality, science and technology uh, displays the purposes and the mystery of God in miraculous ways and, and actually authenticates and validates the Christian faith. Uh, and so they're not at odds nearly as much as the media would like for us to think. Then we come to this whole idea of the media. You know, I find it fascinating uh, how um, in American media, people can talk about praying and talk about Jesus. And, you know, it just seems like it's natural. In Canada, when we see it happen, it does happen. As a matter of fact, I think it's happening in an increasing way. And uh, when it does happen, it still stands out. It's like, wow, okay, CBC, CTV, they allowed that. They, they actually didn't shut it down. And so, um, and so then this area of arts and entertainment, and we know today if you, you follow the arts world and the, and the entertainment world, there's an awful lot there that is anything but like Jesus. But so how do we impact that? Well, the truth is, that's the purpose the Holy Spirit was given. That's why the Holy Spirit is poured into our lives. It is to help us to be able to go. These should not be looked at. Any of these areas of influence should not have boundaries around them that says keep out or keep your Christian virtue or values out. No. We, we should be able to go into these environments, operate in these environments, function in these environments, work in these environments, and be influencers for Christ, we should be able to take the kingdom principles of God right into all these environments just as much as we would bring it into the church environment. Now, we will never do that in our own into, you know, intellectual abilities and craftiness and skills, as good as that is, all is. We will never do it without the power of the Holy Spirit. And that's why Jesus said to his disciples, the text on the screen again this morning, Acts 1 8, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in the education field, in the arts and entertainment field, in the science and technology field, in media and government and family, yes, even in the church, you will be my witnesses. Now, I want to sort of shift here a little and talk about the influence the influence of the Holy Spirit or the lack of it in our individual lives. Now, I can come up here on a given Sunday morning and share a sermon, share a teaching, and after having done this for nearly 30 years on a fairly consistent basis, I don't have to have come out of a fiery Pentecostal uh, altar time or come out of a, a week-long prayer and fasting to be able to stand up here and, and share with you and to some degree, you know, affect you at some level. 
But when I do consistently come out of these environments and stand here, my, my sense is that it will have a deeper impact on you. When the Holy Spirit and the my personal interaction with the Spirit of God throughout the week and consistently in my ministry and life is occurring, I have a sense that I, and I know it based on the Word of God, that my entire ministry, everything I do, whether it's up here, whether it's meeting with staff, whether it's uh, planning, whether it's, uh, you know, just going about my daily routines, I believe they will be much great, they will be much more enriched, they will be much more fulfilling, and they will be much more effective. The same is true for you in your life. In many ways, you know, we sometimes find ourselves faking it. You know, we stand wherever we are, whether we're in our homes, in our family life, in our relational life with other people, even in our relationships with our spouses, whether we're in work, whatever, we carry the banner Christian or we, we consider ourselves to be Christian. We, we can do that and, and many times we can just be faking it. You know, we know it. Many of us are raised in this. We've been in it long enough. We know the church culture. We know the lingo. And we can pull it off. But that's not God's intention for us. God's intention for us is that we would be filled with the Spirit, the knowledge, the wisdom, all that comes through the life, life and the Spirit, that we'd be filled with that on a daily basis. And whether we're interacting in a classroom, in a school classroom, whether we're interacting on a job site, wherever we are, we would be conduits through which His Spirit is being dispensed on a continual basis. The Holy Spirit equips believers for effective living. That's the goal of the Spirit. It's not to just, you know, so we can have this wonderful, profound moment. I remember as young people, first one, we, uh, there was a real move of God going on in our church, and, and us young adults were in on it, and, uh, you, know, you know, it was like every, after every event, we'd be comparing as to who, who had the great most goosebumps. I mean, who had the most, you know, most, uh, who felt the most, energy inside or whatever. I don't think that was necessarily a bad thing, but it's not about that. Now, the goal of the Spirit is to transform us, every aspect of our being, every fiber of our character, and to take us on a journey that's fascinating both for us and for those who are observing us. I, I want to take us on some of that this morning. I'm going to share a couple of remarkable stories with you in a bit. One of the areas, before we do that, that the Spirit is expressly works in is our prayer life. Many believers, many people who come to Christ often fumble around in this arena of prayer. It's like, how do I pray? How do I approach God? What's proper prayer? What's, you know, how, how do I go about this? And, uh, and the goal of the Spirit is to really infiltrate and impact that aspect of our being because that's, that is the real cauldron in which this whole life is formed. It's in prayer. In, 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 whether it's in various forms of prayer, whether it's in meditation, whether it's in uh, you know, uh, prayer of intercession, whether it's in worship, uh, what, the various forms of prayer that we often talk about, you know, the Spirit wants to do its work in that arena, and that's really where the real formation in our lives occurs. It's in, in prayer. There's a first scripture in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, 27. says, Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray as we are, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings and, for, and too deep for words, and he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the world will of God. In this arena of prayer, when the Spirit is involved, it's not mere words falling off your lips or thoughts coming out of your head or even intense desires coming out of your heart. No, that's all wonderful, but it's deeper than that. It's richer than that because the Spirit actually is able to go so deep into your soul. And at the same time, that Spirit is the Spirit of God. And these two merge, they come together. And the dynamic influence and effects of that is heart shattering and mind blowing. 
Prayer is powerful, made more powerful when the Holy Spirit is intently engaged. I don't know how many of you are aware of Bruce Olson. Any of you ever heard Bruce Olson's story? Anybody in the congregation at all? Yeah, okay, a couple of you. What, a, what an amazing story. And uh, for fear of forgetting some of it, I, I have myself a few notes here this morning on this guy. 19 year old American guy. He's just drifting through life as any young 19 year old. He ends up at a weekend camp for young people in their looking for, you know, what's God's plan for their life? What's, where did the Lord want to lead them? And so, sometime before, he had, he had seen a, a photo on a Christian magazine, missions magazine, of the Montauk Indians in, the, uh, in South America. And, you know, just seen it. But in that particular gathering, on that particular weekend, he had an encounter with the Holy Spirit. Now, it's not a Pentecostal environment. It was a different environment. But in that moment, he had a profound encounter with God, and he felt the Spirit say to him, I'm calling you to bring the gospel to this tribe. Now, this tribe, they were uh, looked upon as uncivilized, completely uncivilized. As a matter of fact, you know, they were considered to be cannibalistic, which they were not, but that's what the rumors were. And... And so we began to approach missions agencies to see if they would send him or sponsor him or at least help him some way. Everyone turned him down. And everything he talked about, they said, no, 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 it can't be done, can't be done. It's been tried, it can't be done. Well, he gathered around them a few people. And he was, as he prayed about this, it became more intense. And the Spirit began to speak more expressly into his life. And connected him with some individuals, they dared to go with him into the jungle to try and find this group. Well, on their, one of their missions to find them, they made many missions, failed attempts, but eventually they go into the area and they, they stumble upon their region. In that, at that point, without getting into all the, too many details, a four and a half foot spear pierced his thigh. The others scattered, they're gone, they leave him. <laughs> great friends. Uh, so anyway, they're gone, uh, but he's, he's caught. He visits, you know, they, they find him, and they, he, he feels he's going, he's about to die, cries out to God for everything, lightning, thunderstorms, earthquakes, nothing God does, nothing even, so he's taken off. Miraculously, miraculously, a few days afterward, all the drama subsides, and we'll get into them. One guy there, Arababasha, I think I got that right, but it's AKA Bobby, that's what he became, that's what he became called afterward, accepted Jesus. Of course, he had to break through the language barriers after he got past that stuff. After Bobby accepted Jesus, People were fascinated. The tribe was fascinated. They have 32 different constituencies. They all came together for the festival of the Herod. And at that, on that occasion, Bobby began to sing in their language the gospel. He sang, listen for this, you think an hour and a half service that goes sometimes into an hour and 45 minutes is long? He sang without break for 12 solid hours. He sang the gospel to them. Everyone in the longhouse was silent. Here's the, 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 the theme of the song was this. There are many trails in the jungles, Bobby said, but one trail that goes to the horizon. And Christ came to walk that trail so we can walk in his footsteps. And through his song, he shared the gospel. And they understood for the first time the story of Jesus Christ, his shed blood, his resurrection, ascension and promised return. Hundreds came to Jesus. That old tribe was transformed. A tribe that was considered ignorant, he started schools, he started teaching them. This guy, I think he now, yeah, I saw him interviewed recently, I think he, he can speak fluently 13 languages or 15 languages. Uh, and uh, he, 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 uh, he helped them set up an education system, medical system, legal system. Today, over 400 went on to graduate with degrees 
up until this point. They have doctors and lawyers, theologians and philosophers among them. They are a renowned tribe. Who was behind it? The Holy Spirit. You see, this is the work of the Spirit. The work of the Spirit is just not to have Sunday morning gatherings, and that's wonderful. The Holy Spirit wants to work in our lives. He wants to take young men, young women, right out of Family Christian Center and send you on journeys that you can't even imagine. Your wildest day dreams would never take you there. Not only young men, young women, he wants to do that with every person in this congregation. Who knows but the Spirit of God is working something huge. And you will never know if you don't tune your ear to the voice of the Spirit. I'm going to tell you how to do that this morning at, toward the end of this time together. I want to talk to you about one more missionary. How many of you know this lady by the name of Cecilia Piper? Any of you know Cecilia Piper? We have no one in the audience knows Cecilia Piper. Well, this book is hard to get now. I saw it yesterday. I think it's 70 bucks, bucks or something. It's called Summer Was Yesterday. I read this many years ago. This lady out of Maine, U.S., she was a lobster, lobster, uh, lobster. She's not a fisherman. She's a fisherwoman, a lobster fisher. She was an air, aircraft uh, mechanic, <laughs> very, uh, very tough lady. Uh, she was uh, uh, in a in a service where the Holy Spirit was being outpoured in a powerful way, and the Spirit spoke to her and said, I want you to go to the northern peoples in Alaska. And everybody she began to share with this would say, you can't do that, you can't do that. <laughs> There's lots of people who say, you, you can't do that, it's not possible, you know. I mean, you're a, a, a lobster fisher, aircraft pilot, yes, maybe, but, you know, to go up there, that's, that's insane up there, you, you, you're never going to make it. Well, despite all that long, long journey, she eventually gets there. And I, for the sake of time this morning, I cannot do this, but I'm going to read you a short chapter in her book. Temperatures drop steadily to minus 20 degrees and then minus 30, a common occurrence from early December. By the way, she went to Wainwright, not Wainwright, Alberta, Wainwright, Alaska. There's a Wainwright in Alaska. The, alert, the Arctic darkness was made the more intense, and the insistent wind that raked the open land, land slammed the gates by man-made shelter in defiance until the timbers rattled and the chimney flew screamed in protest. When Sunday morning arrived, I made ready to walk to the Presbyterian Church. I wanted to become better acquainted with the people, and if possible to search how the reason for God having led me to this village which was so far removed from the kind of life I had known as a point air worker on the coast of Maine. Dressing as warmly as possible, I still had not acquired all the footgear such as skin boots and heavy woolens needed for that climate. But with my wolfskin parka on, I decided walking half a mile to the church. The air was calm, but the temperature had fallen to minus 60. And we had that here a few weeks ago. Breathing was difficult, even with a scarf over my face. As I neared the church, I found that the exertion of walking in that frigid atmosphere under such an encumbrance of clothing had been forcing me to breathe more rapidly. Now I was gasping for hair to the point that I was unable to breathe regularly anymore. Frantically, I turned to see if anyone was behind me, and thankfully there were. I signaled to them immediately as I passed out. When I came to, they were holding my head over a hot fire in a furnace. I had frosted lungs, and they were trying to thaw out my lungs so I could breathe. Although not feeling well at all, I regained my breathing somewhat. I joined the worshipers as they sang the old hymns of faith. My lungs and chest ached. Following the service, I accepted an invitation to dinner with a school teacher at their apartment. Halfway through the beautiful meal, I asked to be excused. I was rapidly becoming very, very ill. My head ached. I had violent chills. I was extremely tired. Every breath was painful as I made my way home to, at the edge of the village. 
During the short time I had been away that morning, frost had formed on the interior walls and glittered in the light of the gasoline lantern. I built a fire, then, shaking with cold, crawled into my sleeping bag. Breathing was painful. Pneumonia had set into my tortured lungs immediately. Gradually, as the room warmed, I slept. For three days I lay in a fever, coughing in agony, barely able to stand when necessary. I attended the fire as long as possible. Now I was too sick to care. I just wanted to die. The fire went out. Darkness, cold, and silence filled the room, broken only by the howling wind, day and night. At noontime on the third day, a gray light cast an appearance in my quarters for a couple of hours, and then darkness again. It was in midwinter. I had neither eaten nor drunk so much as a cup of water during that time. All my food and water supplies were frozen. Heavy hoarfrost frost now clung to the interior walls. Without help, I knew I could not last much longer. Death would overtake me in hours. Quietly, I prayed, please, God, I'm sure this is not your plan. Why am I helplessly dying in this lost and empty place? Why am I here, thinking you were leading me? Disillusionment and despair filled my soul. Coughing foam and blood, I covered my head and shook with cold. A pounding on the outer door interrupted my thoughts. I couldn't speak loud enough to be heard. Footsteps in the entryway, more pounding, then someone entered the dimness of the room. It was Peter, the store manager, who was an elder at the Presbyterian Church. Accompanied by a, a rocking cough, I forced my words painfully. Come in, Peter. Peter approached my cot in the corner of the room where I lay huddled in the sleeping bag. The interior walls were now two inches thick with frost. Well, said Peter as he stomped his feet, big missionary sick, huh? Get up, get up, you're not sick. <laughs> Great compassion. In a state of shock at what I was hearing, I sensed resentment rising within me. Peter busied himself about the stove, building a fire. Suddenly he turned to me and said in less, uh, in less disagreeable tones, we missed you at the store and post office, so I came to see where you were. My Bible lay on the end in the, of the table by my bed. I whispered, Peter, can you read? Looking down at me, Peter drew himself up to his full height and proud and said, yes, indeed, I can read. I'm a 12th grade graduate from the school in Anchorage. I'm also a ruling elder in the Presbyterian Church. Of course I can read. In agony of body and soul, I continued, Peter, please read James 5, 14 and 15. The fire was now burning briskly, and a measure of heat had began to penetrate the intense cold of my eyes. Peter lit the gasoline lantern nearby, opening my Bible. He read, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise them up. And if you have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven. Peter finished reading, closed the book with a snap, and placed it on the table. Peter, pray for me, please, I begged. For a moment, Peter looked dumbfounded and then very angry, and clenching his fist, he glared at me as he leaned over my cot. I will not, I will never pray for tenant. It's a weak person. Over the many years, the intrepid of the North had suffered in extraordinary at the hands of white people from many parts of the world. They have taken advantage by traders, explorers, adventurers, whalers, American, English, Russian. Yes, even some missionaries had dealt falsely with these kind-hearted, essentially happy people. Consequently, with Peter's response to me, was one of my having added insult to injury. His anger against all whites rose within him, and for a moment, I thought I was about to hear the brunt of it. After all, these people had never had a white missionary live among them. Looking at Peter's dark visage, bowing over me, I mustered every ounce of strength I had. And with the courage born from long association with God, I continued, Peter, God has sent you here. You are his servant, not mine. You are an elder in the church. If you do not pray for me, I will surely die. In this storm, no plane can come to the village. I cannot go out. I am too sick. If I die, my blood will be on your hands. I am ready to die, but what about you? The torture in my lungs prevented further conversation. I turned to the ice-covered wall and closed my eyes. 
I couldn't have cared less about life or death. The silence was broken only by the hissing of the gasoline lantern and the howling of the storm. Somehow I did not blame Peter for his attitude. Deep down I could understand. Moments passed. I sensed no movement away from my cot. Then a miracle occurred. Through clenched teeth, Peter began praying in his Eskimo dialect. He dropped to his knees and prayed more softly and sincerely. I turned to look at him and to pray silently with him. And with great tenderness, he reached his broad hands forward and laid them on my chest. Visibly shaken by the experience, he continued to pray as tears coursed down his cheeks. Prayers were being answered. The wrecking pain and congestion in my chest were instantly fading. I could breathe. It was as if a great elephant had suddenly lifted his foot from my lungs. When Peter finished praying, he stood to his feet, wiped his eyes, displayed a beautiful smile. With emotion, I said, Peter, I can breathe. It doesn't hurt anymore. I'm healed. Peter exclaimed, you're healed. I'm all clean inside. He placed his hand on his own chest as he breathed a great sigh of relief. All clean inside. I'm a very happy man, and I no longer hate anyone. Peter, I continued, Jesus Christ has made you clean and whole and filled your heart with his great love. It's one of the most memorable experiences of my life to see the Lord change a lost soul right before my eyes and heal my own body. Peter stoked the fire, made some tea for me, and returned to tell his wife Bernice all that had happened. I sat comfortably, once again able to breathe normally. Sometime later I awoke, banked the fire with soft coal, and another cup of tea, fell asleep for the duration of the day. It was the first good night's rest I had in three days. Awakening the next morning, I found my appetite needed attention. Replenishing the coal, I went about the business of brewing coffee and toasting bread over hot coals on a fork. Although I sensed strength returning to my body, this activity so exhausted me, I crawled right back into my sleeping bag and fell asleep. And off awakened me. Visitors, I called. Come in. Not having been in the village long, I couldn't imagine who it might be. An elderly gentleman stuffled in, snuffled into the room and sat in the chair by my bedside. We spoke briefly of the weather and of my health. And then he asked, could we pray? He wanted what Peter had. He told me that Peter was very, very happy, and he had related to others how he had prayed with a big missionary and was all clean inside. I gladly prayed with the man, talked with him about Jesus who loved him. Throughout the day, others came to sit at the side of my cot, kind, politely, friendly people who wanted to know why I was there, how I happened to come all the way from Maine uh, to the top of the world, Alaska. God moves in wonderful ways among the hearts of the people. There grew a bond of affection between these people and myself, and I led many, many to the Lord over the next weeks. That's what the purpose of the Holy Spirit is all about. Is that something? This thing is not complicated. There are nine gifts of the Spirit. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them this morning. I want to give you an opportunity to allow God to work in your hearts as He's already been doing here this morning. There are nine gifts. We're talking about the Holy Spirit equipping believers for effective ministry and witnessing. These gifts are meant to equip you and I, prepare us to be missionaries like the two that I shared with you about this morning. The wisdom gift. All of a sudden, these are underlined on my PowerPoint for some reason. The Lord must have to make a, an extraordinary impact this morning because I didn't underline that. Okay. Uh, the wisdom is the ability to make decisions and give guidance according to God's will. This gift involves applying spiritual truths in daily and practical life. I have experienced words of wisdom on numerous occasions, whether it be in leading just doing life, but certainly in leading this ministry. Just this past January, when I was praying, God, what can we do to move this forward? The Spirit spoke expressed into my life on a, on a morning, and I've shared the miracle story with some of you members, and I don't have time this morning, but I will share it at some point. How God led us to purchase 
the plasma makes tools. It was, that couldn't be done. We had approached, we had done this, we've tried this in the past. No, no, no. And how that unfolded, it was based on a word of wisdom from the Lord. At every juncture step, when we've done things there and moved things forward in various ways, it has come about through words of wisdom. Knowledge. Knowledge is a, this involves an intimate understanding of God's character and will beyond what is possible through human intellect alone. There are things we read it in the Bible. We can read scriptures. Scriptures are complex on many levels. But the thing is, there is this supernatural knowledge and this unraveling of the mystery of God that happens sometimes that absolutely just shocks us. Where does it come from? Where does this knowledge come from? You've had those moments. Some of you just, when you've been just awestruck at what's happening, you've, you've read the scripture before. You've had this experience before. You've talked to God before. All of a sudden, you have an whole new understanding and insight. Many years ago, God touched my heart in an amazing way. I've been raised, you know, in, in a pretty solid background, fairly strong teaching all the way through, and, and so, you know, uh, it's, it's nothing to do with lack in that area, but, you know, I, I was, I was always struggling to make this connection between the art of God and, and wayward believers and wayward, uh, you know, this whole idea of backsliders and all that, and one, one morning in prayer, God just, the Spirit just said something to me in a way that, and this is not anything great, it's just, you know, you probably have this thought as well, but it's the way the Spirit put it in my heart, it changed my understanding. And he said, Edwin, how far would you go for your, for your own th three children? I thought that there's no limit. Uh, everything. Oh, sell everything, give it all, whatever it is, there's no limit to where I wouldn't go for the three kids. And then immediately had this amazing understanding. Well, that's what God's like. That's the Father. And, and it was just in such a way it unraveled. One of those things happened, like, was like profound. It's like, it's like all of a sudden, you know, 10 volumes were written, dropped into my heart. It would take me weeks, and I'm still unpacking it. Knowledge, supernatural insight that comes from God. The same we see between spirits. You know, sometimes people think, well, is this demonic activity? Is this, what is this? You know, and, and we, we've, We've had some interesting, uh, called to some interesting scenes over the years and, and had to deal with some situations that were unique. And, and so oftentimes people think, well, and so you're trying to figure out, so pastor, you're going to, is, is, this, is this demonic? Is this uh, to do with mental health? Is it to do with, you know, people are going through stress and anxiety? And it's amazing. I talked with someone this very, this very week, and they, they unpacked for me how the Lord had led them to discern, in a particular case, uh, uh, what was going on. And, and there's, there's always uh, uh, these areas where we need direction. Is this the Spirit of God at work in my life? Or is this the enemy trying to get me off track here? Uh, distinguishing between spirits is not always about the demonic. It's, it's trying to help you determine what spirit is leading you now. Is it my fleshly desires that's leading me here? And is it my fleshly desires that wants me to do this? Is it, uh, is it yeah, is it the dark side, evil? Uh, uh, or is it God? Is it the Holy Spirit? And people get caught up. You don't know what to do in those situations. The gift of discernment of spirit helps us discern what's going on. Right? Uh, these are known as the revelation gifts. There are three, there are three different uh, uh, classes of gifts out of the nine. Then there's the power gifts. Faith, a deposit of extraordinary confidence in God's promises. You've been praying for something for years. You've been praying for illness or sickness or disease, uh, uh, whatever. You've been praying for a breakthrough in a certain area. And, and yes, you pray faithfully. You pray based on the Word of God. You pray because the Spirit, the Scriptures invite you to come and pray bring your petition before the Lord, but then there's, there's that moment when something supernatural happens and you, you're, you have a download of faith that enables you just, just in, in a very short time to just grab a hold of that and claim it and receive it in Jesus' name. This is, a, this is a supernatural faith. Some people operate more or less in these gifts. There's the gift of healing that enables Christians to, to serve as channels for God's healing power. You know, as we talked about in James, the anointing of oil. When Peter prayed there, he was, he was a, a, a good, he had been a good church guy. He had been an elder in the church. But his relationship with God was, was very shallow. And yet when he laid hands on her, 
he wasn't he wasn't a guy who would just spend an hour talking in tongues. He had just not come off three weeks of prayer and fasting. Here's a guy who really, you know, maybe or maybe not, <laughs> questionable whether he was even a genuine Christian. But what happened here? God, by the Spirit, deposited supernatural healing. This is a work of the Spirit. It doesn't always depend on us. Now, we know the missionary he was praying for. Obviously, it was a factor involved in that narrative. Then there's miraculous powers. You know, an example in the New Testament is when, when uh, uh, Paul was bit with a, with a serpent, and he shook it off in the fire, and, you know, it would no effect on him. There's, there's supernatural, the, this gift is the ability to perform signs and wonders that authenticate God's word and the gospel message. The power gifts in the emerging church uh, in, in uh, South America, Africa, Asia, uh, it's now in northern European regions where the Spirit of God's been poured out in Pakistan, these areas, in huge ways. We see the power gifts in operation in a unique way. In the Western church, it seems as there's less and less of this. I won't get into that this morning for the sake of time. Then there's the vocal gifts as the worship team comes back this morning. The gift of prophecy, this allows the believer to receive a message from God and deliver it to others in the church. It's not always about foretelling the future, although it can be foretelling. But it can be a message of encouragement and edification. It often occurs in preaching and teaching, and people wouldn't even know it without your paying keen attention to the fact and you receive that's a prophetic word that came through the pastor or through the teacher this morning. It's a prophetic utterance. You did. It just came as a part. Often, as a matter of fact, most often, the prophetic operates in the preaching of the word of God. The speaking in tongues, we've talked about that. And then the interpretation of tongues. We've talked about that in the past. I'm going to ask everyone to stand this morning again. I don't know about you, but I have a sense you feel the same as I do. It's like, Lord, I want to be more open to the ministry of the Spirit. I want to operate in the words of wisdom and words of knowledge. I want to add that as a common occurrence. You know, our lives would be so different if we if we tapped into the Holy Spirit for every decision we made. Amen. If we sought the mind of the Spirit for every decision we made. You know, uh, a brother was telling me on this week. Just recently, he was in a in a restaurant, and and he was just paying for his own meal. And all of a sudden, a little voice behind him said. Uh, you need to pay $100 for that family's meal across the lake. And so he did it. And when the waiter came, he discovered it was, it was basically the same cost as the bill. You say, you know what? That's word of knowledge. Didn't happen in a real out the cost of service. It happens in a restaurant. <laughs> this is practically the we would make so fewer bad decisions if we would allow the Holy Spirit to operate in our lives. And you don't have to be super spiritual all the time. I mean, it's good when we can live life close to the Lord and be tuned to with the Lord all the time. Yes, but you know, we are all human and we all have seasons when we struggle. And that comes from everyone on this platform to the person who's just starting out. We're human. We have our seasons when we're passionate about God, we're going all out for Him, and then we go through seasons in life when we come through some hard knocks and we just get a little thrown up. If you open your hearts this morning, just open your heart right now. Normally I invite people forward, but I'm not going to do that today. I just feel right where you are. I want this entire room to be an altar service this morning. Right now, would you just maybe close your eyes might be a good place to start just so you block out distractions. If you would lift your hand, you don't have to lift them way over your head, but you would just do some gesture. It just, just positions you. You don't have to. But again, these are little actions that say, yeah, Lord, I'm, I'm right here now in this presence. These outstretched hands or open hands kind of is a symbol, Lord, my heart's open. 
I'm feeling in my heart in recent weeks and for a long time that the Holy Spirit really wants to work. I, I, you know, I mean, in our lives in a, in a fresh way. And those gifts, He wants those gifts to be in operation in our lives every day. Where you are praying for the sick, where you are laying hands on the sick and they're being healed in coffee shops and on job sites as well as at church altars. I want you to get a picture of something. This atmosphere is thick with the Spirit's presence. Jesus is present, Father, Son, the Spirit's present. And the Holy Spirit is always, that's just how he operates. You know, at any moment, the atmosphere is filled with these gifts. You, you don't have to be in a church environment, but we're in a church environment this morning, but some of you are watching us, you're not in a church environment. Right where you are right now, the Spirit of God is present, and, and the atmosphere is thick with His presence, it's seeded with gifts. And you can see the dancing hand of God. It's like the dancing hand of God is over this assembly this morning. And he just wants to just drop. Just as you went out to throw seed upon a soil that's been prepared for a lawn or to, for, you want a seed for whatever reason. The Spirit of God is seeding. He's in the atmosphere. He wants to seed this room with gifts this morning. He wants to seed the place where you are with gifts. Right now, as you open your heart to Him, He wants to fill you with gifts. From this day forward, you are going to begin to hear words of knowledge like you've never heard it before. You are going to have wisdom. You are going to know what to do in complicated situations, whether beyond the job, whether it be leading and raising your children. You know, just yesterday, a, a couple was telling us how they, they navigated something very complex with their daughter. It's like, wow, it's the word of wisdom and word of knowledge and operation in their lives. You know, from this day forward, you are going to begin to lay hands on the sick and you are going to see them healed. From this day forward, you're going to see miracles. Already, many of us have had miracles. Rhoda and I can stand there and tell you um, um, how many times we've experienced miraculous. It's amazing. Father, I ask you, Holy Spirit, do your work now. Do your work as we worship in this place for the next one. Holy Spirit, do your work in the hearts of your people. If you're in this place this morning, you feel like, I don't know, I'm a far off from God. Just turn your heart to the Father right now. Your Father wants your attention. It's not based on your goodness, it's based on His goodness. It's His goodness. Receive you, the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus.